Welcome to Gardening with Style. Mushrooms are getting a lot of attention these days as a health-promoting superfood. They are both good for us and good for the planet by absorbing pollution and fighting off viruses. You could describe them as nature's recycling system. In Iowa, spring temperatures and wet conditions bring out the coveted morel mushroom, and for many, that means the hunt is on. But beware, these mushrooms can be tricky to identify and difficult to find. Cindy Haynes takes us on a mushroom hunting and safety lesson with fungi experts Lina Rodriguez Salamanca and Leonor Leandro. Thank you, Lena, for showing us around and taking us mushroom hunting today. We've got a gorgeous day to do it, and I'm a novice hunter, so um, I appreciate your help in doing this today. Your fungi or your life? You've been doing this for a while. Tell me, how long have you been mushroom hunting? Well, I, I love uh, fungi and mushrooms in general. Mm -hmm. I'm a microbiologist uh, by training, and uh, I used to hunt in the tropics where I'm from, mm -hmm. uh, and actually I learned to hunt for morels here in Iowa with Mark Bitosh. Oh, and he's a good guy to learn stuff from because he, he spends a lot of time in the woods. That's right. That's true. So before we begin, before we get into the woods, you've brought us a lot of things to kind of consider to have on your treks in the woods when you're mushroom hunting. Can you explain what you have here and where it goes? Because you have a certain stuff that goes in the basket and certain stuff that goes on a fanny pack. That's right. So first, uh, take care of yourself. So remember to pack some repellent with you. Mm -hmm. uh, ticks are always around. Yes. So make sure to um, use them and your ankles and reapply when needed. Um, sunscreen is also a good idea. You know, protect yourself from the UV uh, light. It's right. very important. Inevitably, you will get your <laughs> hands dirty. So it's always good to have something to clean your hands with. Sure. So there you go. Uh, if it rains or if it's too sunny at some point, you know, a good poncho and a hat will be great. Um, this one is one that Mark uh, taught me. Nice. It's a little brush. So it turns out that as you walk in the woods, you may be tracking things that you don't want to track, oh. like invasive species and plants. Okay. So every time you're going to enter, <clears throat> make sure that you're brushing your shoes. And then when you're out of the woods, brush them again. See, I would have thought that was for the mushroom itself, but it's to clean your shoes. Well, that's, that's a great point. For the mushroom itself, we uh, have something different. A little softer. More delicate, that's mm -hmm. right. So we do have that for the mushroom, the little uh, brush. And then we'll put this one here. Um, now, when you use the brush, you want to make sure that you're cleaning it. Oh. So I normally carry some alcohol um, swabs or, you know, a little bit of ethanol with you or and I'll carry those in there. It also works great if you happen to cut yourself, you can clean yourself. Sure. So First aid not? kit are ready to go. That's right. Now, when you're gonna be looking at mushrooms, and if you don't know what you're looking at, mm -hmm. you may be taking some photos. A ruler is a great tool, because yeah. it will give you the idea of what is the size, and whomever you're consulting with will absolutely uh, love to have that perspective of what you're looking at. Right. So if you need a mushroom identified, if you take a picture with a ruler, then it makes it easier for you to identify. That's right. Excellent. And then a camera, good camera, mm -hmm. uh, lots of uh, point and shoot that do a very good job, but also phones these days. Yeah, mine's pretty good. They do great. Mm -hmm. And you can save your spots in there, take lots of photos and video. Phones are great for that. Um, I, I also carry um, resources in my phone. So I have this little booklet, know your plants, your trees, that mushrooms definitely are associated with certain plants and trees. Right. So things like this are great. Um, and there's also a website that I often use in my phone um, from the university, from ISU, that is uh, an interactive guide to identify trees. Nice. So I love that one, but I, I have a copy of this one, so I carry it too. And then I also have a booklet uh, on mushroom identification here. Right, that's a great resource too. Yes. Let's see, what else? So I, you know, if you're getting into oh. um, identifying more, you're gonna need to be looking at the very fine details right. of the mushrooms. And so there's plenty of- um, Magnifiers. Yes, that yes. you could use. Hand lenses. That's right. Yes. And so for every, you know, for every need, you can find one. And so I carry one, a Wait. couple, and one with illumination. It's yeah. kind of cool. Way to, to be a scientist. I like it. Absolutely. And then, last thing, 
-hmm. I think uh, this little knife here, it's nice to harvest mushrooms above the soil level so that you're not carrying any soil debris with them. So we'll put that there and take notes. Where did you collect it? What was the date? Uh, you can kind of make your own diary on what you hunted, what you that's saw. That's good for next year when you decide whether or not that's a good spot or not. That's right. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I think for personal care, you get hungry, Yeah. carry some food with you, some good snacks. And if you end up hunting for a variety of mushrooms, the best way to pack them is in parchment paper uh -huh. or paper bags. I was wondering why you had parchment paper. Yes. Okay. So paper, not plastic. Right. Okay. Plastic, um, the humidity in the plastic will be problematic mm. and then the mushrooms will start decaying. Okay. I'll get the basket if you've got that and let's go hunt some mushrooms. Sounds good. Got it? Yes. We're ready. <laughs> I only know the jack in the pulpits because of the rust that comes oh, into them. Oh, it's a wonderful wildflower jack in the pulpit. Yeah, you should hey see guys. some nice clean ones. Uh -oh. I found some. Come here. <gasps> Yay! All right. More than jacks. Mushrooms. Look what I found. Ooh! Nice little patch over here. Oh, thank you so much for scouting it out early for us. Oh, yeah. This is <gasps> nice. Great Wait a minute, spot. I don't see any. Okay, so they're kind of darkish and they're the same color. They're well camouflaged, they're <gasps> the leaves. Here's there the ones. Yes. You see these two little guys over here? Oh, here? those are tiny. Yep, and let's see. Well, I found this one a little while ago. Oh, that one's that's, beautiful. Yeah, isn't that? Absolutely. Oh my gosh, that's that's eaten size for sure. Oh, oh, there's a, over there. You see those? Look at those. Those two over there. Very cool. Very nice. Now, so what are there? These look a little different than one another. So what is what? Well, these are Morcella's um, Angusticipis. Angusticipis. And they are the morel that's most easily confused with a false morel because the cap is not completely attached to the stalk. So uh, when we cut them open, I'll, we'll show you the difference. But and that's, that one's different than that one? Yes. 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 Yeah, awesome. That's that one there. an Americana, the more, oh. the more common one that people love to eat. Nice. Yes, that looks more like it. So yeah. this particular site that we're here, it seems a little wet, a little damper. We're kind of in a lower spot. What yeah. else do we look for when we want to find a good morel hunting site? Yeah, definitely the, the wetter areas are going to be best. So low areas, we're near a, a river here, a little creek. Um, and so when you have these kind of moister areas that are more shaded, so the moisture doesn't um, get evaporated as, as quickly. So those are good. And then oftentimes if you're around the base of trees like elms or ashes, hickories, right, or logs. Um, mm -hmm. and sometimes they're live trees and they, they're around the base of those trees, oh. or sometimes they're just feeding on dead organic matter. So uh, stumps like freshly cut or uh, elm stumps, okay. um, and then other just down logs. Okay. So you just kind of have to train your eye to look for those Very, caps. And yes. you may need to move um, the leaves around a little bit because they're, they're hiding, they're popping up from under all this leaf material. So sometimes, you know, you really have to, I thought there was another one somewhere in here. Oh. And it'll just surprise you. They are, they are perfectly camouflaged. Very well camouflaged. In the leaves, I, I agree. Yeah. Can, can we grow our own mushrooms? Well, it's complicated. Uh, you could, but this, this would be easier, wouldn't it? It would. <laughs> so there's a lot of mushrooms that we can uh, very easily cultivate indoors. Uh, you just get a little kit and, you know, they will go quickly uh, and grow in. But this guys will yeah. go into this resting stage. Oh. Um, so it's hard to lure them out of that resting stage. Oh. And so they won't fruit in a way that you can predict when right. the fruiting body is ready. Right, so that's why morels are so expensive because they're probably been harvested, mm -hmm. well, not grown. Right. Mm -hmm. They're hard to find and also the conditions that make them fruit are not really well understood. They're kind of a mystery. 
And ah. so that makes it even more exciting to hunt for them because ah, you, get, you feel very more, lucky when you that, do find them, yes. I think that makes them tastier too. Yeah. Yes, it's part of the experience, you know? Probably. Great. So we need to harvest these and then we need to find some more. Should we mark yeah. the spot and let some of these get bigger or harvest some of them or should we? Yeah, I think clean yeah. at least the bit, that bigger one. Yeah, let's do this. One. Okay. We got one. Yeah, there was a third one. Oh, we got another one. Yep. So when harvesting, just always remember to go a little bit above the soil. You can pinch or use a knife. Just be very careful. Now with morales, always make sure that the stalk, the stalk here is hollow. That's really important. Um, and if you happen to get any of the debris on it, that's where your uh, little brush, brush will come in handy. And you yes. can brush them. Mm -hmm. Let me see. What did I do with this? I probably should cut them. Yeah. Let's see how hollow that is. Yeah. yeah. That is nice and hollow. Mm -hmm. That's one of the distinguishing features of a morel is that there's no cottony fibrous material inside the stalk. Oh. So always, if it's not hollow, do not swallow. It always have to be hollow but in the I, stem. I like that. So you see, this guy are completely hollow there. And so this, is, this attachment is halfway in the cap. Oh, Very so that's important. why it's about the half. Yep, half okay. free. So it has that attachment right there. If you compare with the other little guy, where did it go? I think. Oh, that one that right guy. over here. Mm -hmm. Let me get that. Or did you have it? Mm -hmm. Lots of morale. Here we go. Oh, here. Yeah. So okay. if you compare with the other ones, if you want to hold this one, mm -hmm. this one just attached to the base of the cap. This is more of a Normal morel, uh, yellow, gray morels is the morchella americana and is a tasty one that everyone is looking for. So should we hunt for more? Let's go hunt for some more. Two or three is not enough. I just want to find a morel. One of the americana ones. A bit, a bit more rain, they would probably. So here's another mushroom. Oh, something important too is as you are like moving plants around, be very aware of any poisonous ones. Right. You know, poison oak, poison ivy, all those things. Right. Yeah. We're in the wild ginger now, so it's okay. <laughs> so. Oh, I don't know what this one is, just at the top of my head. So mm -hmm. if you don't know what it is, you don't eat it. No, definitely do not eat it. Okay, nope. so that's the one thing I yes. know about mushrooms. It's yes. the most important one. <laughs> yes, definitely always seek, and you need to seek um, expert help. And just knowing even the, the big category is not enough. You really need to get to species because okay. sometimes different species within the same group, the same genus, uh, may vary in their, how toxic they are. Right, Yeah. right. So you're looking on a, your phone on the mushroom guide. Yes, so and we have a little booklet that is called, uh, called Safe Mushroom Foraging. And so in here, I'm just looking at the calendar um, and what will be popping up right now. Okay. So I'm thinking it may be this Flamulina, maybe. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna follow up and go find it in the photo and read what this may be. Right. And so it doesn't look like a, a typical morel at all. Nope. Um, and I spotted it because it was a totally different color mm -hmm. than everything mm -hmm. else. Yeah. And it's got a very interesting underside to the cap. Yes. So this is, um, there's two big groups of what we call mushrooms in general terms. One is what we call the basidiomycetes. And so these kind of mushrooms that have gills, they have a cap, yes. a stalk, and they have these little... Uh, yeah, they do look like little gills. Little gills. Mm -hmm. um, these are in the basidiomycetes. Okay. The morel is actually a completely different group, and they're in the ascomycetes. Okay. And so there's not a lot of edible ascomycetes, but morels and truffles, nice. which are very <laughs> famous. Two of the and best. Yeah, two of the best are, are, um, are in the ascomycetes. And they, it's in the way they produce their spores, right. um, in little sacs in the morels and ascomycetes, and in little um, club-shaped cells outside of that cell. So. Um, there's many other things, the bracket fungi, the jelly fungi, uh, puffballs, right. um, that are all in the basidiomycete group, right. big group. 
uh, because of the way they produce their spores. Right. Morel are kind of uh, unique. That's true. So, but just because it's in the brachomycetes doesn't necessarily mean it's all edible. No, so, no, no. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of poisonous um, mushrooms. Um, yeah, so in you really have group. to know. And it's a lot harder oftentimes to identify correctly something in this group than in the morels. Because morels have that hollow stalk and have this pitted cap right. that really helps us distinguish them. Right. Still have to be careful. There's some lookalikes that we're going right. to um, have to look carefully. Okay, so we found more mushrooms, but not more morels. <laughs> so should we continue hunting for morels? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yes. You want a full basket. I do. <laughs> That was so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad we found a few. Yes. There's a couple of things I would like to show you though. Oh, okay. Especially if you're a beginner hunter. I am. There's a couple of things that you really want to be aware of. Okay. There's a couple of um, false morels. Hmm. So those are not in the genus Morchella. And they look very similar to the one that we just, um, that we were hunting. So this is the guy, the Morchella punctipes. We have it right here. Remember, hollow stem right. attaches halfway. So this is the good one. That's the good one. Okay. Now when you compare it with this two burpas, burpa conica and burpa bohemica, they have a lot of similarities. Okay. Except that the stem is not hollow. There's a little bit of like cottony fuzz on the stem. And the attachment of the cap, and you can see it on this one here, is at the very top. So, so it's not all the way like the typical morel. That's right. Hmm. So you really have to kind of dissect some of these to make sure you know what you're getting. Yes. Okay. And if you're not sure, always remember, it's not hollow, don't swallow. You don't need anything that you don't know what it is, but mm -hmm. for sure, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the consequence of eating something like a false morel, these verpers, or there's another gyromitra genus, could be pretty serious. I mean, you could get really serious gastrointestinal symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, you could uh, get into a coma. You can even kill you. Oh. Um, and the other thing that also you should know is that some people don't respond very well to eating mushrooms in general. So mm -hmm. even though they're not poisonous, if right. you're a first time eater, if you're eating something for the first time, eat a small amount and You'll always test it. yes, mm -hmm. and always cook them. Uh -huh. uh, and with morels, you should always cook morels before you eat them. Um, and do not mix them with alcohol. Yes, and some uh -huh. morel species uh -huh. are toxic if ingested with alcohol. Yes, okay. hmm. and then of course always be really careful about selecting a good area to collect the, the morels because, for example, if you're collecting them near um, a farm where there's animals or is a contaminated site with pesticides mm -hmm. or herbicides, or if they're getting old and maybe have been partially eaten, you Ooh. could be ingesting other things that will right. be poisonous Some to you. Some food safety issues. Yes, food consider. safety issues, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you so much for the lesson. I'm so glad I went more hunting with you. It was a lot of fun, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Walking through the woods, looking for mushrooms, you can almost imagine coming across a magical woodland creature like a fairy. Inspired by that, we're gonna create our own fairy garden. A fairy garden is any miniature garden that features plants and whimsical decor that's meant to lure fairies and bring good luck to the gardener. But more broadly speaking, you can define a fairy garden as any miniature garden with some decor in it. And they can be very simple, like this succulent garden with a simple piece of decor like this one here, or something a little bit more elaborate like this container here that has decor in it that is specifically made for fairy gardens. They can be in containers or your very own garden. You're really only limited by your creativity. Today, we're gonna to be creating our own fairy garden, and I'm gonna walk you through the steps to create something like this. We're gonna start by coming up with a theme. And that theme is really important because it helps to find and narrow down what we're looking for. There are so many things out there that you can potentially do when it relates to fairy gardens that a theme can help kind of hone you in. So we can do things like colors, places, even uh, locations or styles. So it can be beachy or it can be woodland, it can be pinks and reds or something like that. After we have our theme, 
I like to start by looking at some of the decor. And there are lots of different options out there for you to use. You can start with little figurines like these. They range from all sorts of different things. Um, a lot of times they have really nature themed um, ideas here like frogs and birds and insects and other things like that, including fairies, of course. You also want to include things like uh, rocks and stones, shells and marbles. You can do twigs and bark, dried pods and seeds of flowers and other things like that. Um, any of these things like these acorns and pine cones are all really fun additions to a fairy garden. Most fairy gardens also have some kind of moss, whether it's sheet moss or Spanish moss, reindeer moss or things like that. And you can also create your own art for your little miniature garden. This little fairy house right here was something that was put together with just a little bit of hot glue and some bark and other pieces of wood and moss. Of course, we also need plants for our fairy garden. And over here, I have a variety of plants. We're looking for things that will do well in the same light, soil, and water requirements. After that, you can use any plant that you want. I'm creating mine for indoors, so I'm going to be using house plants. And a lot of places that sell house plants will sell little miniature plants like this. They're great for terrariums, and they're great for things like fairy gardens. When I pull all my plants together, not only do I want to make sure that they have the same light, soil, and water requirements, but I also want to look at some of the forms and shapes. I want things that are moundy and upright, maybe even trailing. And I also want to look for things that have different textures and colors. So I have a nice variety of, of colors here, as well as some fine textured things and some more coarse textured things. Finally, after that, I have to find my right container. And you can really use any container. The only requirement is that it has drainage so that the excess water can go out the bottom. This is a really nice one because it has a nice, broad, wide top. It gives me more room to kind of do my fun things in my fairy garden. But they can be anything from a boot or a broken clay pot to a whiskey barrel to a window box or a large saucer like this one. The potting soil in here is perfect for the plants that I have. It's just typical potting soil. If I were doing a succulent one, I might use something that's a little more sharply drained. Uh, whatever works well for the plants that you choose will work well for a fairy garden. I like to start by placing the major items first. So my theme for this is gonna be kind of like a rustic woodland uh, fairy garden. So I'm gonna place some of this in and kind of plan out how I wanna, in general, put this in. So I got my little fairy house here for my, for my fairy friends to live. And I think I'm gonna have a small little path here and then plants and, and some other little rock outcroppings over in this area. So I can start by, I kind of wanna get an idea of how I want to lay these out. So I'll just kind of set these all in place. Come in here, like this and this. I kind of like how that looks. So now I can get all of my plants potted up. We're just going to pot these up like we would any other dish garden or indoor planter. Just pulling them out of the pots. If they're really root bound, we might break up those uh, roots a little bit. These are all relatively happy and healthy. You can find these plants in any garden center. In many cases, there's a lot of really wonderful variety. It can be a little dangerous, actually, because there are so many fun things. And because they're so small, you can often get a lot of really fun things for a really good price. So once I have all of these plants potted up, I can then add my major decorations, which in this one is going to be my little fairy house here that I built. I'm gonna set that in here. And then I really like to kind of cover the soil. It gives a really nice finished look. I like to cover the soil with a little bit of sheet moss. Sheet moss you can also find in just about any craft store and garden center, especially if they specialize in fairy garden decor and fairy garden materials. So I can break some of this up and, and place it in. It really kind of finishes off the way that it looks. And then I can add, this is the more fun part, I can add in some of my fun things. So I'm gonna put in a little rock path here for my fairy. I have a 
few little pine cones here I'm gonna set up here. I got my little sweet gum seed pod there. I got my little owl friend. He's gonna sit kind of right over here. And then this is actually one of my favorite little whimsical decorations. I'm gonna squeeze my little guy in here. Actually, I'm gonna set him over there. And I have my fairy garden. Care for this fairy garden is gonna look like many of our house plants because this is made up of house plants. If you're using annuals or perennials, you would care for them much in the same way. In a container, we're gonna water this in because we always water in plants after we plant them and water when dry. This one needs good indirect light indoors, so, um, and all the plants here would be really happy with that. When it comes to fertilizer, we're gonna use very little fertilizer. We don't wanna encourage a lot of growth with this because it'll change the way that our fairy garden looks. And we wanna kinda of keep it miniature and small for as long as possible. So an all-purpose fertilizer, maybe once or twice through the growing season at half strength is probably all we'll need. In many cases, our potting soil already has a little bit of fertilizer in it, so we're really good. The last thing I'll mention is that your fairy garden will change over time, and as things get tired or grow, or as things start to decay or change, you can change it up. That's part of the fun of a fairy garden. There's always something that can be tinkered with, changed, added, swapped out. Have fun with it. As we leave you, enjoy a tour of another whimsical art exhibition. Ribbit the Exhibit features larger-than-life frogs in a garden setting. Thanks for joining me on Gardening with Style.